If you uh, maybe over the last several weeks or months been going through a time of grief, uh, we have a wonderful uh, support group and uh, time of fellowship together, and it'll meet today, the first, always the first Sunday, but at 4 o'clock uh, here at the West Campus. Secondly, um, there, there's a baby shower that's coming up, and that's going to be on April the 28th and uh, from 2 to 3.30 for uh, Heath and Taylor Sin. And, in fact, the uh, soon-to-be grandmother of uh, this child is uh, Tammy Sin, our children's minister here at Providence, and we appreciate her. She's going to come now and uh, share with us about uh, bringing your Bible, the Scripture, and maybe a couple other things there, too. <coughs> morning. Before I get started, I found a nice, lovely bracelet. It's a Ronaldo bracelet on the, but my husband knows what that is, on the bathroom floor if someone lost their bracelet. So, it is yours. <laughs> you know too. All right. Um, this week, we had a great time um, doing some activities with our kids during spring break. So uh, we were given some suggestions, or I was given some suggestions from a friend um, of some ideas that we could do, and uh, because my eyes aren't so great, I misread what she said, but then it turned out to be a really cool uh, God thing because we were able to implement a few activities this week. So we traditionally, or this is our third year, we do service and missions on one day or two, and then we also do a fun day after that. So our service and missions kind of crossed over both days. So the first day we met, we took labels and covered our water bottles with messages to, to people using a scripture. And we boxed up or put these in a basket and delivered our uh, living water bottles to different gyms in the area. We did Planet Fitness, Crunch, and Max Fitness. So they had free waters for the people that came in that day to get one with messages from our kids. We did uh, little note cards with another, well, it wasn't a scripture, it just said, uh, Jesus is love bubbles for you. And we tied those on bubble bottles. And so on Wednesday, when we went to the park in Auburn, our kids were little missionaries and they went out, they introduced themselves and they gave the other kids at the park a bottle of bubbles. So, um, <clears throat> and then we also decorated bags that we'll use a little bit later for our, some, our volunteer fire department and a local police department. Our fourth little project, um, y'all do that now, I guess. Four scripture, sure. Let's do the scripture first. Let's do the scripture first. All right, so because we have a scripture memory verse every month uh, here at Providence, we are also about to start a project soon with scripture memory for our church. But one of the areas that we wanted to emphasize was talking to our kids about using the physical Bible and opening that Bible. Today was Bring Your Bible to Church Day, which we all hopefully bring, whether or not it's your physical Bible or your uh, Bible on your phone. Um, and we wanted you to take a minute to open your Bible to that scripture, and we will highlight or underline or mark that. So, kids, if you have your Bibles, adults too, I have extra highlighters in the back, but <clears throat> I don't know logistically how we can get those out. But we're starting with a verse that we hope most people would be confident with. Um, and if not, we really want to emphasize that and get you to practice that this week so that you can memorize it. But it's John 3.16, and if that's not already marked in your Bible, please do so now. Or if you have to do it later, you can do it later. But it's, for God so, and you can, you can say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. And kids, as soon as you have that memorized, make sure you tell me so you can get a little extra prize. All right? Um, our fourth project that we worked on this week uh, was one that we could uh, say thank you to Mr. Chuck. So as our children move on, they move up into the youth department, and so we wanted to make sure that we um, said thank you as well. So... <clears throat> We have a tree here that has 20 branches, and our children use their fingerprints to um, 
put the leaves on the branches so that you we could let you know that we're thankful for helping us grow. And it just says, we thank God for you. And then PBC Kids thanks you for 20 years. So Mr. Chuck, if you'd come up and receive this from Providence Baptist Children's Ministry. test the wind was so crazy that day we're just thankful we were able to accomplish that task anyway thank you thank you tammy and to the children uh, what a what an awesome expression of love and appreciation and uh, you know, we, we're, we're very fortunate here at Providence to have some long-term ministers within our fellowship, and uh, Providence has a history of that, and Chuck is a big part of that, too. And, of course, uh, coming up here with Dr. Tom here for long, he's always out in front of us, and we're always chasing him. And, uh, but we appreciate uh, the support that our church gives us uh, with regards to longevity and very thankful for the love and support and encouragement that you have uh, shared our way. I want to take a moment, though, and I want to recognize uh, Chuck's family. We've got one of them standing up already. I know a little bit uncomfortable, but all of uh, Chuck Adams' family, would you please stand? I know we've got Carissa, we've got uh, Jesse, children, grandchildren back there. And we just want you to know how much we love and appreciate you with regards to expressing uh, your love and appreciation for your dad and mom as they are a part of this fellowship. And we thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to welcome two uh, guys from his place, and uh, Rick Hagens and Harvest Evangelism. And they heard Chuck was preaching today, and they wanted to come and uh, hear a good word from him today. So we're glad you guys are with us, too. And Tom's going to come now and share a word. Since all of Chuck's family is in the back, I'm not sure that we really got to see them. I, would you all mind just the immediate family just coming on up here? And Chuck, you can come with them. I know it's, you got some kids, but y'all, just come on. Bring them all, bring them all. That's good. Huh? Okay. Come on, come on up. Just make a great backdrop here. <clears throat> And I had not planned to say this, but uh, this is a great tribute to Chuck right here because his family and Carissa, but all of his family are involved in some type of ministry with the, for our Lord with the local churches. And uh, I, I tell you, as a dad and as a grandfather, that means so much to me, and I know it means so much to Chuck personally. And, and we, we appreciate his family and the support that they give. And uh, I know he's got some other uh, not immediate family that are here too, and we, we thank you as well. I wrote a little thing. Chuck, come on up, come on, stand up here just a second. I wrote a little thing in the, uh, the messenger that comes out in Alabama Baptist, and um, I pretty much stated everything that I wanted to state in that little article. So if you will just give me the privilege of reading this so I don't mess anything up. Today, we pay tribute to Chuck Adams, who has more titles and hats to wear than any other church staff person anywhere. He does all this with a servant's heart that is focused on ministry. It has been my joy and privilege to work with Chuck the entire time that he's been a part of our staff at Providence. We've worked together on many projects, both church related and some on off times. And most of those, I beat him in golf pretty well. But. Uh, <laughs> 
so much that I haven't played with him lately. I don't know what the deal is here. Scared. Scared, yeah. But anyway, it has always been such a wonderful team player. And when it comes to assisting and encouraging the music ministry, um, and that's the thing about our staff, we're, none of us are territorial. It's not about any of us individually. It's about Jesus, and it's about his church, and it's about supporting and helping each other. So I will close by saying I will forever be grateful for his friendship and willingness to help all the time. And on behalf of our church family, I would like to present this plaque to Chuck, and let me read it. It just says, presented to Chuck Adams in recognition and appreciation of his 20 years of ministry for our Lord to and through the family of God at Providence Baptist Church, April the 7th, 2024. Let's give Chuck a big round of applause. Kind of the worship that we have planned today all kind of relates to Chuck and uh, to his service to our, our family of God here. First of all, we have the praise team that's here and they're going to be with us just a little bit later. But we also have our student choir here and <clears throat> I decided for us we're going to sing the song that he's probably heard the most and he's heard it all 20 years that he's been here, and we love singing it still. It's called Shout Amen. Choosing the hymns to sing today, I thought about Chuck and especially, and, and just looking at the first phrase of this hymn, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. 
and it told thy love to me. That could be Chuck's testimony, especially that first two lines, I am thine, O Lord, and I've heard thy voice. So it's all about service for our Lord in ministry. Let's stand as we sing together. I am thine, O Lord. As I mentioned earlier, our student praise team is uh, here with us today, and they're going to sing uh, Holy Spirit, and uh, if any of you want to sing along, that's fine too, but I appreciate them and the ministry they do, uh, especially with our young people every Wednesday night, but it's great to have them as a part of this service and the tribute, not only to Chuck, but to our Lord. If you guys would, I know you just sat down, but if you would stand and worship with us. We would love that. <laughs>
20 years. I can say this, those 20 years had more of an effect on my family probably than me because I was always chasing after the dream of God and the vision that God had placed in my heart. 16 years of school. Mind you, it was supposed to be six, but I'm an overachiever. I stretched it out to 16. <laughs> my wife had to put up with every bit of that. My children had to deal with every bit of that. Uh, the years of ministering here and working at the tire plant, my wife had to put up with that, and my children had to put up with that. But can I say that, like about a year ago, I looked up on Wednesday night, and my daughter, who was up here with the praise band, was leading me in worship. That struck me. And I said, maybe I did something right. Maybe it's all going to work out. But I do have to thank my wife, Carissa. She has been, y'all, no man has done better. I outkicked my coverage all the different ways you want to say it. Uh, she's not only beautiful on the outside, she's beautiful on the inside, and she has been my anchor through everything. And my daughters have impressed me. My son-in-laws are fairly okay. <clears throat> For the most part, they'll do. Um, my grandchildren are the light of my life, and uh, it all goes to them allowing me to do this. I have a great group of leaders that work with me. Mr. Jason is kind of like my second-hand guy back there who leads the praise band, teaches Sunday school. I could not do what I do without him, for sure. And the rest of my leaders, Stephen, Katie, and I'm not going to name it. Half of them aren't even here, by the way. That, like half of them said, hey, by the way, we're skipping your um, acknowledgement there. And I'm like, okay, fine. The, cut your check next week. But I'm going to tell you something. In call to youth ministry, there's something about it. You've got to love teenagers. And I do. I love teenagers. I know some of y'all are thinking, what? I do love teenagers. They, uh, they keep me on my toes. They keep me feeling young sometimes and acting young more than often than not. And speaking of which, Rusty said the first time he ever met me was on a softball field. Those are the days we're trying to leave out of all of this. Um, those were the days when my, they required you be active at church to play on the softball team. And because I came once a year and played on the softball team, I was active. That was before my call to ministry, by the way. Um, but it was good days. Providence Baptist Church has been amazing to me. We've been members here way longer than 20 years. My children were raised in this church, and this church has loved us, loved my family. There's no church out there that can love a family more than this church has loved my family. And I appreciate and love every one of you for that. I tell the youth just about every Wednesday night, I love them. And it's easy for me to do because I love y'all too. This church, I love the people. Not The buildings aggravate me because I'm the one that keeps most of the stuff going, but the people of this church, I absolutely love. But enough about me. Uh, I could stand up here and give you my testimony but I don't want you to care about my testimony. I want you to hear about Jesus today. Because that's the reason we're here. It's all about Jesus. Now, I threw a curveball at the 8 o'clock. I told them to turn to John chapter 24. Don't try to find that. There is no John chapter 24. <coughs> Luke chapter 24 is where we'll be. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 34. Now, if I get to going too fast, just bear with me. And by the way, can I, I, I cut out a lot of this in, in introduction, but I want, do want to say this. I think that our young people today are facing things that they've never, we never faced, for sure. And in the past, we haven't had to deal with this. Adults are dealing with it too, but this anxiety pandemic that we're living through right now. When I first heard this coming on the scene, I thought it was... There's a politer way to say this, but um, just another way of getting by. Pulling my leg kind of thing. Anxiety. Everybody was talking about anxiety and how anxious they were and, and how it was ruining their life. And, and I thought, you're just saying that so you can get by with life. But then I've got to thinking about it and I've noticed something. Life moves so fast nowadays. 
Why is it that a 21-year-old, healthy, vivacious, vibrant, whatever the word is, young person needs to drink 10 monsters a day just to try to keep up with what's going on in life? Why is it that adults or adults, grown folks who didn't have to have it when they were in school, but now all of a sudden they're on Adderall because they're trying to speed themselves up so they can keep up with the pace of the world? The world pace is going so fast now that it's amazing to me that we don't run out. And I do say today, I firmly believe that anxiety is a bigger pandemic than COVID ever was and ever will be. Anxiety in our world today is real, and that's because our bodies aren't designed to move at the pace and speed at which we move. I use the examples at 8 o'clock that if you look at 200 years ago versus today, a wagon moved about 8 to 12 miles a day on a good day. Well, today, in a good day, you can travel 800 to 1,200 miles. You had to write a letter to someone, you'd get an answer in a few weeks. Nowadays, I can get you the information I want you to know instantly. The world is moving at such a pace, we've got to slow it down somehow. We cannot keep up with it. And I got the answer to that, and I'll give it to you at the end of the sermon. There are two answers to how we slow this all down and make it work. But somehow we've got to deal with this anxiety pandemic and the speed of the world and the noise. And the way we do that is we focus on the right thing and start letting some of this other stuff go to the side. My wife has noticed here lately that I don't always answer text right away. That I don't always answer the phone as soon as it rings anymore. I've gotten tired. I, I can't just keep, every time I get a text, just instant replies. And they're coming at you a hundred miles. And these young people, the way they communicate, it's amazing on one hand, but then it's also heartbreaking because they're missing the entire world around them while they communicate on the phone. And I'm not throwing off on phones and kids with phones. I love kids, and I love phones. They're, they're great. I can talk to my grandchildren. I can f FaceTime with my grandchildren when I don't get to see them every day like I wish. But we've we got we to gotta slow it down. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm preaching to the choir here today. Luke chapter 24, was that it? Verse 13 through 34. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. That same day was the day of the crucifixion and the day of the resurrection. So Christ has been crucified for our sin, by the way. The only person I know of that was completely found innocent, but yet sentenced to death. He was found innocent of his own sin, innocent of his own life, but yet he was sentenced for our death and therefore give our, our sin, so therefore giving death on the cross as his punishment. So he, the same day that he, same weekend that he was crucified, and the same day that he rose again, these two men, or two guys, or two people, were on their way to Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Could you imagine you're walking along the road talking about, hey, you know that Jesus that we thought was going to be our Redeemer? That Jesus that we thought was going to be the one who saved us from the Romans? That Redeemer that was going to put us back in control and power of our own little state? That Jesus, they're talking about, they crucified Him. And now He's gone. Now, now we don't even know where He's at. He's no longer in the tomb. But as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus Himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing Him. Can, can you understand? I had a hard time with that when I first started reading. I read this years ago. But I had a hard time with understanding why God would keep Himself away from Him. Then Why He didn't just walk up and say, Hey guys, let me tell y'all, I'm alive. Y'all are downhearted. Y'all are walking the road home and, and you're hurting. And you're feeling discouraged. And you don't know what to do. I'm here. I'm alive. Why He didn't do that? But instead He kept himself from them they didn't recognize who jesus was well he asked them what are you discussing together as you walk along as if he didn't know as if he didn't already know how many times in the scripture do we see that jesus already knew what they were thinking talking about by the way that didn't stop let me give you a scary thought real quick god knows everything you think not just everything you do but he knows everything you think so you might ought to think about that. I did that without getting tongue-tied. 
Well, they stood still with their faces downcast, and one of them named Cleopas, Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? Are you living under a rock? Where have you been? Do you not see what's going on? How would it feel if somebody walked up to you and said, isn't this world in a great place? I mean, we're just doing so great in this world. It's a wonderful place to be. This world's just rocking along. Everything's wonderful. And you would think this person has been living in a cave for the last 50 years. Because the, word's going down, the world is going downhill faster than we can count. And that's why these guys feel like Jesus comes up and says, hey, what's going on? What's up, guys? And they're like, where have you been? Where have you been? He says, what things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. By the way, they still didn't get it. They called him a prophet. They didn't call him Redeemer. They called him a prophet. They didn't call him Lord. They called him a prophet. They didn't call him Messiah. He is all of those things. He is not a prophet. He is God Almighty. Well, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that He was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. By the way, it amazes me that these same disciples, now they weren't a part of the twelve apostles, but they were disciples of Christ, which means they had traveled with Him, learned under Him, been taught by Him, so they knew a lot of things that were going on. They would have known about Lazarus being raised from the dead just a week or so before, after four days in the tomb, but yet they found it amazing and unbelievable that Jesus could have raised up three days in the tomb. They handed him over. It's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, but they still didn't get it. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. I find it ironic that they're sitting there telling Jesus about what had happened to Him. Don't you? Don't you, you ever wonder when you're talking to God and you're pouring your heart out? Do you ever stop and think He already knows? See, God's listening to our lives. He's watching our lives. He's there every moment with us. He already knows. Still cry out to Him. Don't get me wrong. Cry out to Him. He wants to hear our voices. But He knows our struggles and He knows our pains. Well, as they approached the village, no, I'm sorry, He said to them, I got ahead of myself, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. How foolish you are. Have you not even read the Scripture? Now, this is kind of a throw on us now. We need to be reading our Bibles because we don't, there's another Sunday coming. You know, Brother Rusty so aptly put the, the sermon that was preached years ago about it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Well, that Sunday got here, but there's another Sunday coming. And we've got to be prepared for that Sunday. And how do we prepare for that Sunday? Through prayer, study, reading the Word, fellowshipping, communi community, and sharing the Gospel. But he said, the prophet had spoken, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Didn't it have to happen? What y'all are whining about, what y'all are crying about had to happen. You see, that's what I don't, I don't understand why we can't get the whole point that it had to happen. There had to be a virgin birth. There had to be a crucifixion. There had to be a resurrection. There had to be a Pharaoh. There had to be a Moses. There had to be a Noah. There had to be an Enoch. There had to be, all these people had to live and had to be and do what they were called to be and do. Pilate had a part in the play before the world was ever formed. All of these things had to happen. They were a part of the plan of God to get it to where we could have fellowship with Him on this earth and after our death for eternity. We could live in heaven. It's all a part of that plan. It had to happen. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in the Scriptures concerning Himself. But as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if He were going further. But they urged Him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So He went in to stay with them. When He was at the table with them, He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized Him, and He disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, 
Were not our hearts burning within us while He talked with us on the road and opened the Scriptures to us? I said at 8 o'clock, here's the thing. You know you're prepared when you're here on Sunday morning if your heart burns when you hear the Word of God. You know that you're prepared to stand before the Lord when you come to church and you hear the Word spoken. Whether it's Brother Rusty, me, wherever you go to church, if you don't go to church here, whoever's preaching the Word, your heart should burn inside of you when you hear the Word of God. Because that's God speaking to you, helping you understand how to live your life and how to get to where He wants you to go. How to do the things He's called you to do. I think we're losing that in the church today. I don't think we're coming prepared. I, I preached a sermon a long time ago, and it's funny. Ironic, I don't guess funny. But it was at Real Town Baptist Church. And part of the sermon, one of the points was we don't come prepared to worship. Instead, when we, when we leave the house for church in the morning, we've got a band full of kids, and they're all screaming and hollering at each other. And the wife is telling you that you're overdrawn in the checkbook, and, and you're telling the husband, not me, not me. But the husband's telling the wife that she spends too much money and the kids are screaming and hollering. And then all of a sudden you pull in the church parking lot, the van door flies open, everybody grabs their Bible, puts on a smile and comes into church. You're not ready for worship. We need to come to church ready to praise God, give Him the glory, give Him all that He is due. These guys said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Why? Could you imagine hearing Jesus Himself? I can't wait for that day. Well, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. I told Brother Rusty earlier, these weren't Baptists. They were sitting at the dinner table, and they got up. I don't know where they, what, I, don't, I don't know. But the Baptist ain't going to get up from the dinner table and go anywhere. But these two, the, they got up, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Now remember, this is late in the evening, and it's a seven-mile trek back to Jerusalem. But they were intentionally going back to tell what they had seen and heard. By the way, we need to tell people what we've seen and heard. We need to tell people our story. We need to tell people that we once were lost, but now we're saved. We need to tell people that our, we were blind, but now we see. We need to tell people we couldn't walk, but now we run because of Jesus in our life. We need to tell people. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true. The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. So the eleven have figured it out. Well, then these two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when He broke the bread. So they hurried back to tell the story of what had happened in their life. And that's the point. We've got to learn to tell the story of how God has made a difference in our life. To change the world, we've got to change the community. To change the community, we've got to change ourselves. Revival, yes, in the world would be wonderful, wonderful, but until we have revival inside here, we can't revive anybody. Until we have revival in our own heart, we can't revive the church. Until we have revival in the church, we can't do anything with the community. And until we do the church and the community, we won't have anything to do with the state. We've got to start right here inside of ourselves and have a revival on a personal level and learn to love God the way we're supposed to. According to Micah 6, 8, which was on the screen earlier, which is a youth verse that I've had and it's been my verse for my entire ministry. And it basically says, act right, be nice, and love God. We quote that on Wednesday nights with the youth group. Micah 6, 8, God says that He requires three things of us, that we act right, be nice, and love Him. And that, that, that is so true. And we've got to share that and tell that to the world around us. There are three points I want to make real quick and get out of here. Christianity is about locality. Being a Christian is about where you are. And I've said this before, being a Christian is like real estate. It's location, location, location. You're either a Christian and you're not doing everything you need to do, or you're not a Christian and you need to become a Christian. And that's true for all of us. Because, it's, like I said at 8 o'clock, if you were doing everything you're supposed to do and you had made it to the top tier and you had finished everything God had for you to finish, you'd be in heaven with Him, not here. So we've got to keep striving to get better. We've got to keep striving to get better. These guys were on the road, by the way, on the road headed home, and Jesus met them there. How many of y'all have had that experience? Where you were at, Jesus met you there. I love the saying that if you seek after Jesus, He will find you. Because I was walking down a road at one point in my life that I didn't need to be walking down, but Jesus found me there, and He sat down and He talked to me. And He said, you need to straighten up and turn. 
and I gave my life to Him. If you've got that same testimony here today, then your location is important because where you plant yourself is where you minister. Well, I'm sure they were discussing a lot of issues. They were distraught, upset at the turn of events that had been taking place, disillusioned by the things around them. Sound like the world today? But Jesus met them there and made it okay. Visibility is the second thing I want to talk about here. Visibility. Have y'all noticed they make cars different nowadays? I'm talking to the older people. The young folks, got, they don't have visibility issues like I do. But the cars nowadays, you can't look back over your shoulder and see out the window like I used to. Now, my chiropractor says it has to do with my neck being stiff as I get older. But I think it's the way they're making the cars. I just can't see back over my shoulder like I used to. But our visibility, we've got to be able to see where we're going. We all have blind spots. As I've gotten older, like I said, driving, I make people madder nowadays because of the blind spot in the car because I'll start easing over and, I, you know, none of mine have the fancy little mirror on the, or light on the mirror that blinks and tells me there's somebody beside me. I have to look in the mirror, whatever, and I may forget it. There's a blind spot there where I can, especially in my Jeep, there's a big blind spot in it where I can't see. And I'll start easing over and I'll hear a horn honk because I got a blind spot. Well, all of us have got blind spots spiritually. Is that, is that okay to say? All of us have a blind spot where something's attacking us, where Satan's working on us, that keeps us from seeing God at work in our lives. We all have blind spots that keep us from loving people. We all have blind spots that keep us from serving God the way we're supposed to. We all have these blind spots. We've got to find out the blind spot in our life. These guys couldn't see Jesus because they were so distraught. And they were walking down the road concerned about themselves. Their Redeemer, the person they thought was going to be their Redeemer, had died and been crucified and been put in a tomb and then it disappeared. They had a visibility issue there. I told the youth Wednesday night that there's a list of things that I've got that create blind spots. Friends can be blind spots. And that's true for adults too. The people you're hanging around with you can be a blind spot to what God's called you to do and where God wants you to minister. Family can even be a blind spot. School, for them, is a big blind spot. When they go to school, they can't see God for the work and, and the people around them, the friends around them at school. Our workplaces, our faith issues, culture creates a big blind spot for me. I can't understand the culture of today. I'm sorry. I know I'm just getting old, I guess. I just can't understand. And I'm not talking about the young people and how they act. I can't, you know, TikTok and the dances and all that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. The challenges on, on social media about eating cinnamon. I don't understand why you'd want to do that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the culture of darkness in the world today. See, the Scripture says that Satan is, is, is pacing back and forth looking for those whom he can kill, steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal our very livelihood from us. He wants to steal our joy from us. He wants to kill our ministry, kill our vision, kill our witness, kill our testimony. He's out to destroy us. And we've got a blind spot to that. We're, we're saying, well, you know, it's going to get better or we're just passing it along to the next generation. I'm not willing to pass it on to the next generation. I'm willing to fight with the next generation to put it aside, to do away with it because God has got to win, got to come out in the end. We know that. But we're here to fight a battle and it's a spiritual battle. We've got to get our vision, our visibility straight. And we do that by being intentional. So Jesus met the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Yes, it was a road of despair for them. But Jesus met them in their despair and spoke to them the truth of God's Word and made a difference in their life. That's what we're called to do. Meet people where they are. Speak to them the truth out of the Word of God. Not what we think. Not our opinion. The truth of the Word of God. With love grace and mercy. See, we're not in this fight, in this battle with weapons of armor like bullets and guns and cannons. We're in this fight with the Word of God and love, grace, and mercy. 
I'm not here to tear anybody down. I'm here to build you up in Jesus Christ. I'm not here to take anything away from you. I'm here to give you eternal life. Show you the way to eternal life. I'm sorry, Brother Rusty. He made a check mark right then. He said, well, that's, that's a mistake. We'll talk about it later. He's going to give me some, hopefully give me some tips on all this. He's got notes down there. I'm here to help you find eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And that's the way we're going to reach the world. See, the, the world is fighting the battle in different ways with weapons that we don't understand. We, use, we need to use what God has given us. And that's His love, His grace, and His mercy to make a difference in the world around us. Providence Baptist Church has been good to me for 20 years or longer. I hope and pray that I can stand up for that and honor God in that continually through the days to come. But don't miss what I'm telling you. This world today needs Jesus. There's two things. I told you I had the answer to what is going to fix the world. Two things. The first thing the world needs is Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to. There'll be an invitation here in a little while. Come down front. We'll work with you. We'll pray with you. We'll help you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because that's the answer to the world. Jesus. The second thing this world needs, more Jesus. There's not enough. And it's not that there's not enough because there's not enough of Him. God is so great, God is so big that He could give everything that He is to any one of us and still have the same to give to the next. God can give everything that He is to any one person and He's still big enough to give the same to everybody else. God is so big. It's not Him, it's us. We need to give more Jesus to the world around us. And until we figure out that we've got Jesus on our side, and it's our job to love people and share, tell them about the love of Jesus, then we're missing the mark. My prayer is, for me, going forward in ministry, that I learn to better do what God has called me to do. And that is my prayer for you today also. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for this day. God, I thank You for Your Word and how it speaks to us. Father, I thank You that You were in this place today. I thank You that Your Holy Spirit filled this room. Father, I thank You for these people that come out on Sunday morning to hear Your Word and worship and praise You. And God, if there's anyone in this room that don't know You as Lord and Savior tonight, Lord, I pray that Your Holy Spirit prompt them today, Lord God, that they give their life to You that they change their location from eternity in hell to an eternity in heaven with You, Father. And for those of us who do know You, Lord, as our Savior, I pray, God, that You ignite a fire within us that, that just burns so hot and so strong that we have to give our life to You. But, God, we have to share it with everybody around us. Father, that we have to prove Your love, grace, and mercy by the way we live and the things we say. Father, this altar is going to be open. I'll be down front. Brother Russ, he's down here. Lord God, I just... Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And let us live a life that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided
in Sunday school the past few weeks, we've been studying about um, the early church, the book of Acts. And in chapter 9, verse 31, it talks about the church experiencing a time of peace because of one thing, because of the power and the recognition of the Holy Spirit. We are a unique congregation because of the same thing. Today we're celebrating Chuck his 20 years here. We, in a few weeks, you know, Dr. Tom and, and Miss Gail and Rusty and whatnot. That's unheard of in churches these days. Why is that? Because of our administration here, our leadership, our staff. And it's not just one of them, it's all of them. Right down from Jennifer and Suzanne and Miss Gail, everybody. Because of the Holy Spirit working through their life. As part of our service today, we want Chuck to come down, and Carissa, you as well. And we're going to have a time of laying on of hands. If you want to, if you want to come up and pray with Chuck, please do. Everybody in here, anybody in here, deacons, whoever, whatever. If you want to take a time to come up and lay on, lay hands on Chuck and pray with him, pray with his family. We're going to ask you to come up now. Chris, if you would just stand behind him there. At this time, if you would, come up and pray. Let's stand as we have our closing prayer. There we go. It's kind of like the uh, icing on top of the cake here. Daniel, come stand with me, buddy. Yeah, Mom and Dad can come. Little Daniel Ingram is uh, coming this morning to publicly profess his faith in Christ as his Lord and Savior. Daniel, we all love you, son, and we're so thankful for this decision today, and uh, I know that uh, in the days ahead, we're going to be talking some more about this. Miss Tammy is, is uh, already actively involved in this, and you've got a great mom and dad that are committed to raising you and, and the other children <laughs> to the honor and the glory of God. Amen. So we want to celebrate that with you today, too. And so Daniel will be here at the front, and uh, you come around and uh, greet him at that time. Uh, Chuck, Teresa, and the family will be back there at the back, and uh, you'll get to uh, talk with him, too. And Dr. Tom is going to lead us in our closing prayer. Let's pray. Lord, what a great day to be in your house. 
Lord, we thank you for your spirit that dwells among us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to pray for our brother and his family in Christ. Lord, we thank you for Daniel. Thank you for his family. Lord, we thank you for the, the leadership that is handed down through the generations and it still continues. And we pray now that as we go from this place that we might be truly like that New Testament church that it was filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.